This week's Crypto Recap. A US presidential candidate voices support for crypto as Robinhood comes under fire from regulators for its crypto product. And is meme coin season returning? We cover all this right now in the Collective Shift Weekly Recap. Actionable insights and a breakdown into the crypto market all in under 30 minutes. A lot to get through this week, Nick. Yeah, it's it's been pumping as always. Yeah, my I think the thing that struck me the most is maybe meme coin is back, not just in crypto markets, but in the wider and... As we all know that I think the US presidential election is just going to set off a lot of fireworks mm. for crypto. Now we've got the likes of Trump possibly speaking pro crypto, um, which is probably the thing I'm most looking forward to getting into today. But maybe inflation is the key driving point in the overall macro market. Perhaps you can shed some light in what's happening in macro land and in the markets. Yeah, so the past seven days, you know, in crypto, we're we're relatively flat once again. Uh, Bitcoin around, you know, sixty two to sixty three thousand ETH, around the three thousand mark or slightly under. Uh, time of recording, we've got BTC down two percent, ETH down five percent for the week. Uh, Solana down a bit worse than that. Really, I think you, you see this before sort of key macro events, or at least in this stage of the cycle. Uh, I know in years gone by, we've we've covered on content for members explaining that macro isn't having that much of an impact of the, on the crypto market. But I feel like now we're into the swing of things where it is definitely having an impact. And, you know, with that said, we do have, I think this Wednesday in the US, uh, the, the new CPI data. So that's just one way to measure inflation and the Federal Reserve r- relies on that heavily to guide their decision making to do with interest rates. Uh, so that's coming out on Wednesday. So, yeah, I think just a bit of selling or just, You know, everyone's sort of sitting on the sidelines just in anticipation of that. Uh, We have the expected figure or the annualized figure to be 3.4% inflation. So that would still be quite above the the Fed's long-term target of 2.0%. And we saw inflation, you might remember last month, actually surprisingly jump up from 3.1% to 3.5%. So really the big thing I'm looking for is, look, if it's in line with 3.4%, I think the market will like that. That's just my hunch. Um, if it definitely, if it falls below three point four percent, the market would like that even more. So this is all quite short term stuff at the end of the day. Uh, but that's definitely the thing to be watching this week. Perfect. Um, perhaps we can jump right into one of the biggest news mm. items, which is Robinhood. Uh, they come out. Which, if you're not familiar with Robinhood, Robinhood is one of the most popular stock trading platforms you can use to get access to U.S. equities, for example. They have been rolling out support for different cryptocurrencies and crypto trading in the last few years. They come out and now are in the firing line from the SEC in the US and they will come out to be served a Wells notice, which is just a a notice to say, hey, we're looking into you and you most likely might be getting uh, an infringement notice from the department. This was real shocking to me, Matt, considering Mm. Robinhood was one of the biggest sort of fintech companies, stock trading platform companies. I think the reason why it really took my attention was that it's now it's not just regulated to these crypto, you know, DeFi platforms. They're coming after some of the biggest ones. That is Robinhood. Um, not sure if you were following this one, but you know, it, just to me, if Robinhood are unable to exactly know what the rules are. Uh, Vlad, their CEO, come out and said that hey, they've met multiple times, over ten times, with the SEC to try and get some clarity over what cryptocurrencies they do offer on the platform. Uh, So that's just one of the things I took away from it, that, hey, biggest fintech and stock trading platform out there, they're not confident in knowing how to support and offer crypto services. Mm. Then it's kind of like who else can in a way. I'm not sure if you're following this one. Yeah, definitely. I think if this was just another regular crypto exchange that the SEC was going after, like it, it wouldn't, we wouldn't really be talking about it because given they're already flagged, they're going after Uniswap, they're in, the SEC is in, in a pending lawsuit with Coinbase um, and they went after the likes of Bittrex, Kraken, even Binance US last year. But the fact, yeah, to your point that it's Robinhood, a, a non-crypto native company is is a huge deal, especially especially when you talk about how popular of a, of a service Robinhood is. And given even in the past, they sort of bent the knee a bit to the SEC or, or took an extremely conservative stance of delisting XRP. And they also delisted I think Solana after there were you know allegations thrown out by the SEC, which none of the crypto companies 
uh, really did or if they did, there was maybe one or two of, of like a dozen that actually went and made that conservative approach like Robin Hood did. So, yeah, they're really um, leaving, yeah, putting all their shots out there, really, the SEC and getting, I guess, the importance for, for all of us stepping back is it's just another indicator that things are coming coming to a head really in terms of um, there being some sort of, you know, answer to how the US will regulate crypto assets. Like everything is very slow moving, going through the courts for now is has been the only way anything's getting done. Um, but ideally we want to see some legislature, you know, drawn up in, in Congress or in Washington uh, which is ideal, but these court cases will likely have a big sway on, on how that legislation ends up looking. Yeah, for sure. And I think we've got a good indication that uh, Robin Hood will enter the frame here to to put pressure mm. and, and file these lawsuits mm. because he did say that the SEC is, quote, attacking crypto and they vowed to take the fight to the SEC. So mm. one to watch and no doubt we've got another big player trying to get some clarity for the market. Yeah, certainly going to be a big you know, six to 12 months ahead over in the US. Um, in terms of the ETF update, uh, always important to keep, you know, checking in on the data given so far this bull market, it's been highly, I guess, leading indicator of, of how prices are going to go. Um, and the markets have sort of moved in line with mm -hmm. ETF flows. So checking in on, on how we've been going. Uh, Bitcoin ETFs actually had their first um, week of net inflows for, I think, uh, ending a streak, I think of five, five weeks of net mm -hmm. outflows. Uh, so that was that was you know, promising to see at least, or at least stem the bleeding. Um, and it was probably more importantly or encouragingly for me was we actually saw uh, it come out that a large holder of these Bitcoin ETFs turned out to be uh, through different reporting seasons and, and whatnot, uh, a Boston-based uh, entity called Brace Bridge Capital. And they reported uh, owning 360 or roughly 360 million dollars worth of various spot bitcoin etfs um what's important there is actually you know holding them for um uh, you know presumably for sort of like long-term holding similarly to how you would have gold on your balance sheet or just diversifying um i suppose your assets under management um rather than some of the other news headlines that we'll get to a bit later in the podcast that were not really reflecting this sort of uh news event so again it's sort of going back to what we've been talking about all this time with you know, more details coming out in 2024, you're just going to continue to find out about who is holding these Bitcoin ETFs and, and who is supporting them. Uh, maybe also flagging the Ethereum ETF front. This is coming up very quickly. I think it's May 26 mm. is the date that the SEC has to either deny yeah. or decline one of the ETFs, but that's been really gaining a lot of traction, Matt. Yeah, yeah. The, there's May 23 and May 24. You've got Van Eck on their application due for a final decision on the 23rd. And then the following day is, is another one, which is actually the ARK Invest and 21 shares, their joint ETF application. Uh, so yeah, finally gonna see some answers. As we've been saying that the hopes of, of, of a approval are pretty slim these days. Uh, the sentiment has been falling basically year to date uh, gradually. So, you know, it, some updates probably from the last time we we spoke was Grayscale withdrawing their application altogether. Um, and then ARK Invest N21 shares, so their joint application, they actually su submitted, a, I guess, a revised version of that. And that um, that new revised version did not have the text or information related to staking being involved in the ETF, uh, which again, people might, people can interpret that bull, in a bullish way because, oh, hey, maybe they're in conversations with the SEC and then they're responding to their to the mm. SEC's feedback. Or you could argue it's bearish because you could say ARK Invest and 21 shares have decided, hey, we know a denial is coming up. Let's omit this staking thing just so the SEC, putting more pressure on the SEC to actually come up with a, you know, unique answer to why they're denying these applications. So, the only people who know probably why the motivations for doing this are probably, you know, the executives at ARK Invest and 21 shares. So the market's left to speculate. But I think really to, to summarize it, it's still looking like a very slim chance mm -hmm. that these ETFs get approved by May 23. Um, but, yeah, worth watching for sure. Perfect. Yeah, if you're a, if you're a betting man, uh, poly market have some juicy odds because yeah. basically the entire market is saying we're going to get a denial here. Yeah. 
That's it. Over uh, sticking with the US, and we do have a, a big update that went through um, some of think, the lower the house over there uh, in the US last week. Yeah, so there's a controversial uh, rule that's called SAB 121. Now, this sounds like it's kind of a mundane rule that doesn't really impact much, but it's probably one of the most important uh, discussions that's going on in crypto because it's a rule that essentially makes it near impossible for US banks to properly custody cryptocurrencies. They just set the threshold really high. They have these really mundane reporting requirements that mean that it's not really economically viable for banks to hold crypto assets at the moment in the US. So this is, although a positive uh, move that uh, the House moved to vote and kind of overturn this policy, uh, President Biden does have veto power over this decision and the department come out and said that they were looking to veto it um, if it does pass the Senate. So although it's a small win, you probably expect now it possibly to be vetoed, but this is just a huge uh, narrative to watch because mm. as I've talked about in the past for members, uh, we've seen possible banks t uh, dive their toes into custody maybe. Uh, it's just such a big deal for people who do not want to trust crypto exchanges. They do not want to hold crypto you know, in their own custody, mm. uh, being able to go to your bank and have your bank custody this with your financial institutions that you trust and that you bank with is huge unlock for the industry. So mm. this is one that hopefully if it does get overturned in the next year or so, will really probably revolutionize the way that people custody their crypto assets. Yeah, absolutely. It's a yeah very dry you know, piece of news, but the ramifications you know from this could be extreme like even for so many reasons but even just from an investment point of view like the the bull case for something like bitcoin or eth or uh particularly though particularly bitcoin um is enormous if you if the barriers for banks getting involved in this space um are, are eliminated or make it easier so that's why all of this stuff you know matters uh even though we won't see any you know actual answer or result mm -hmm. for, for quite a while but sticking with the US here, our last one, uh, we do have some, yeah, really major news in terms of the election coming up in November. Um, so far, people have only, you know, spoken about, okay, what's the result of the, what's the impact of the US election this year on crypto? So far, it's really just been, uh, look, risk assets tend to do pretty well in, uh, in election years. Um, therefore, you know, crypto is going to do really well. That sort of has been the extent of like people's uh, you know, how much they care about uh, the election. But we finally saw a bit of a, I guess, more of a focus on crypto last week with, uh, yeah, presidential candidate Donald Trump um, sort of posturing that he's he's a pro-crypto or a supporter of the crypto industry and keeping, I suppose, the industry jobs in the US. Um, so that was, that was a first in terms of his whole campaign, not ever really speaking about crypto. Um, and it's it's something to watch. He was def, and the thing is that he was traditionally really anti crypto. So there was a few tweets of him back in 2019, mm. and he was saying that you know crypto is garbage. You know, same posturing of mm. it's used for illicit activities. Um, you know, he doesn't support it. So this is probably the first conclusive move away from those previous statements, and really sets the scene because the U.S. Democrats have been very anti cryptocurrency whereas probably the republican side has been more favorable mm. so this could be a potential election issue everyone's wondering how much it really matters mm. but it is a sign that um, potentially if a more favorable government gets in what effect does that have on cryptocurrency will more progressive laws be passed because um, at the moment uh, gary gensler um, very hostile to cryptocurrency so any new government that might be favorable to cryptocurrency could replace some of these older people in charge and maybe get some more proactive crypto laws, which no doubt would have positive impacts on the industry. Yeah, definitely. So watch that space. And yeah, finally, we do have here a return of, oh, goes back to our times during lockdown in COVID with uh, GameStop and AMC, Bed Bath & Beyond, all those meme stocks mm -hmm. uh, sort of coming back into the headlines all as a result of this uh, return of, sort of one of the drivers of that meme stock movement, uh, the, the pseudonym at least is Roaring Kitty. Uh, they sort of returned and posted on, on X or Twitter 
uh, for the yeah, first time in a very long time. And it sort of sparked you know, some very strong rallies in, in well, meme stocks. And then also that translated to strong price action for, for meme coins. So, yeah, it's why, I guess, why does this matter? Like, why is this important? Essentially, it signals, I guess, the market sentiment towards maybe mm. more risky items in the crypto sphere, but also shows that, hey, this rally in meme coins in the crypto space is not necessarily totally detached from mm. the experience in the wider market, uh, which can really be sim symbolized by things like GameStop, Bed Bath, that have these manic crypto rallies. Um, mm. And for me, it also brings us back to the point that cryptocurrency was always seen as more volatile than traditional markets. But if we actually look, I saw a cool stat that said that Bitcoin is actually less volatile than Tesla year over year. There you go. <laughs> so it's yeah, right. showing us that, yeah. hey, the traditional markets aren't so far detached from cryptocurrency and kind of looks at this idea that, hey, will things like Bitcoin become less volatile over time? Um, really sets a scene. And I know some major cryptocurrencies such as Pepe move to new all-time highs. Um, these things are always important to look at. And one of the key sentiment metrics we look for when the market starts to get overly euphoric and frothy mm. and piling millions and millions like we saw into Solana meme coins, I think at mm. pretty much the height of mm. the Bitcoin all-time high uh, in March mm. where they topped up. You know, We had developers raising $20 million yeah. to build meme coins for some reason, and they turned out to be essentially rugs and you know, haven't really delivered anything meaningful. So these are just really good points and data points to look for when we're looking at market sentiment. Yeah, for sure. So we'll see what Roaring Kitty does. There's been no indication yet. Uh, they've done their one post, but yeah, we'll see if they have bigger plans. So maybe worth watching. But in terms of uh, the altcoins, there's yeah always things going on in terms of developments or new announcements from these altcoins. We'll recap, you know, some of them in our in our weekly podcasts every week. Um, the ones we want to highlight this week are Infinex. So that's one that's you know sort of stemming from the synthetics team. So one of the oldest and I guess most widely used DeFi projects out there. Uh, they are getting very close to launching. So last week they started a thirty day campaign for people to set up uh, their accounts on on the app and deposit USDC. So what it is, at least from the outset, and why I guess it's what I guess a unique value proposition is, is it's going to be you know a perpetual futures exchange. You know, similar, I suppose there's many competitors out there like DYDX and whatnot uh, in the market. However, what distinguishes Infinex is going to be their push for user experience. So leveraging a lot of the, I suppose, advancements in account abstraction cross-chain communication, you know, innovations that sort of wormhole pushed and, and others. And Infinex is really just trying to aggregate all of those, you know, innovations around the industry from the past few years. And I suppose combine them and deliver a really, well, cutting edge user experience in, I guess, relatively to where crypto has been. So I'm excited to see just how seamless it is to use Infinex. And I will be depositing some USDC over there to, I suppose what's the point of this campaign is to really, if you deposit USDC, uh, you will accrue points and the more points you get, you know, I suppose the quicker it will be for you to start using the the app because I think their, their wait list is more than 200,000 uh, accounts. So yeah, that's just a notable update there. Uh, perfect. And maybe staying on the Ethereum ecosystem, uh, I saw that the Ethereum daily burn rate hit a yearly low. So as we know, a major impact of the merge was this idea of, uh, you know, introducing, um, well, combining the Ethereum burn mechanism with potential uh, more issuance, you know, being left out of the market mm. as activity increases and more stake happens. Essentially, the Ethereum total supply will start to decrease. This is, I think, decreased on an average of about 0.2% or 0.02%. Um, net for the year. Mm. So it's still net deflationary as a whole. It's just hit, well, since the merge, but it's hit a sort of a yearly high, indicating that I wonder if all this activity happening on L2s has really alleviated a lot of this gas burden on Ethereum's main layer. Mm, for sure. That was always the, the sticking point for Ethereum. And I think it's you know, a big reason people point to for its, well, weakness or just its sluggish price action so far this bull market even though it's up more than 150 percent off of its lows 
uh, you know, people saying, well, are you going to call ETH money um, or are you going to call ETH, um, you know, really value accruing and therefore, you know, pricing out people because we saw the effect of, of the scaling, the L2 scaling really took pressure off of gas fees and, you know, the way the cost to use the Ethereum mainnet has come down drastically, which has been the plan. Um, however, now you're not burning as much ETH and people, I suppose, who are really advocating for the burn being a big part of the, the thesis for ETH um, are sort of a bit disappointed. But I think we'd always really emphasized just the need for Ethereum to grow its ecosystem. And I think everything will take care of itself more so than focusing on the burn. So worth watching for sure and seeing L2 adoption really, really continue, which we'll get to soon. But in terms of Eigenlayer, they also had you know big news last week with their token generation event. So the Eigen token can now be claimed and yeah, you won't be able to transfer it for quite a while. I think it's still September, um, but yeah, the claim window is now open for Eigenlayer. Uh, maybe shifting gears now to the uh, Bitcoin ecosystem. One of the uh, biggest development companies that are building uh, infrastructure on Bitcoin to sort of scale in a similar way of Ethereum, uh, Botanic Labs, they raised, I think, 8.5 million to build out this you know uh, different chain that's uh, leveraging Bitcoin. So I think, as I mentioned for members, definitely be on the lookout for a lot of these Bitcoin focused and big building on Bitcoin narratives, which is only starting to ramp up and we're seeing more and more of these core teams funded. Yeah, for sure. That member post was really opened my eyes to the dozens of projects that are going live this year um, in the Bitcoin ecosystem. Uh, sticking on the, the L2s for, for Ethereum and there were some big updates from some, some main players. Uh, Optimism was one of them. Yeah, so they announced support for these L3 chains. Now, all the terminology can get really <laughs> mundane and out there. Essentially, it's just people building another layer on top of Optimism to provide more, I guess, more control over their applications. Mm. Uh, and they sort of said that, hey, here's a framework for sharing different revenues, different uh, technologies with Optimism DAO. So that's a really core potential mechanism for Optimism, the OP token, if more and more of these chains that are built around it can start to distribute parts of their revenue uh, back to Optimism and the Treasury, which was always a big question and mark about you know, any value accrual. Mm -hmm. um, also, I saw that Polygon, their uh, special uh, kind of privacy-focused platform, which is called Maiden, enter testnet this week so that huge focus and really wondering whether privacy is going to get some of this attention we saw other platforms like railgun had a really big uh, rally higher off the focus of privacy uh now this is one that polygon not a lot of people are talking about but they're incubating a lot of different networks and this is one of them that is enter testnet yeah nice keen to to check that out uh in terms of things to look forward to worth just noting here that the fdx uh, administration they proposed a recovery plan so for any ftx users um you know make sure you know this may be for ftx australia may not be relevant but for ftx global the separate lawsuit they're looking like the users may be getting back um more than a one-for-one -one, i suppose return on their deposits as we know the F collapse of ftx basically happened at the the bottom of the market um, and we know that the cryptocurrency holdings have, have multiplied a lot of them in value. Um, so users now are getting back more than a one for one dollar return, roughly 118% of their deposits, um, yeah, which is at least better than one for one. <laughs> yeah, something, but, yeah. but, but obviously not yeah. to be mistaken that they are going to yeah. get the exact amount of cryptocurrency. Yes. It's all dollar value related, which I think is yeah. in line with, I guess, how traditional bankruptcy works, unfortunately yeah. for... Yeah. FTX participants. Yeah, for sure. Um, in terms of rapid fire, we might do a bit of underappreciated or overappreciated. Um, I think I might break my streak of doing underappreciated, mm. it seems, every every, <laughs> every week. And I've gone overappreciated this this week. And it was with respect to the Bitcoin ETF um, headlines. I think, you know, with prices sort of trading flat for quite a while. I think people are getting a bit more desperate for some, you know, really price sensitive, you know, exciting news. And I saw a lot of big Bitcoin accounts sort of sharing that, you know, the likes of JP Morgan and Susquehanna, like some like really, you know, massive banks in the US were investing in Bitcoin ETFs because it was, you know, listed as a holding on their balance sheet. Um, but then we did 
have some corrections coming out from, you know, the ETF analysts over at Bloomberg who did, you know, make a point to say like, don't get too excited because these are simply, these assets are really just part of their market making programs. And what are known as APs, which are authorized participants that are really, I suppose, allowed to trade the ETFs, um, you know, and have special privileges. So they often will have long positions and then they will also have short positions on the ETFs, but they don't have to report the short positions from what I've read. So it sort of just counteracts it and it's really a nothing burger at the end of the day. The Bitcoin ETF news we spoke about earlier with that that Boston-based mm. entity is like much more exciting. Um, but when you see things like JP Morgan buying Bitcoin ETFs, just always just have a, a bit of a, a skeptical view of it, which turned out to be true this week. Um, what have you got for us, Nick? Uh, I've got, and shifting gears a bit, underrated, uh, a bit of a book recommendation here. So I've recently been reading uh, Lynn Alden's book uh, called Broken Money. Uh, that was probably one of my favorite books I've been reading for, for quite a while. Nice. Um, and it's inherently uh, related to cryptocurrency. But it's all about our current money system and then postures, how we can uh, change it with advances of technology. And for example, Bitcoin and all these different types of open ledgers and shared monies. So that was one I really encourage uh, listeners uh, and people who lo love a good read to check out. There is actually a condensed 30 minute version that I was seeing shared on Twitter by Lynn herself that kind of uh, simplifies the book into like a 30 minute snapshot. So maybe we'll attach that one to the show notes because mm. definitely worth a read, especially if you are very interested in you know, money, how did it get here? And then where do we go with the likes of Bitcoin and new forms of money that are hopefully entering the system? Yeah, nice. We'll definitely link to that that 30 minute summary uh, from Lynn. Uh, so no, it's a good... Good recommendation there for anyone interested. Uh, but that is a wrap for this week. If you are looking for more insights, see our revamped weekly shift newsletter, providing free weekly market insights every Friday. Subscribe at collectiveshift.io forward slash newsletter. That's collectiveshift.io forward slash newsletter.